Bionic as an artist is the one whose style many of the young people now use. And they don't even know who he is. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah, that yeah, hip-hop yeah, reggae you. style that he he brung to the table mm. and that certain kind of swagger that he brung to the yeah. table, like them, they're doing that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they don't know where it comes from because it didn't exist in hip-hop before he did it. KRS-One, BDP, they were hugely influenced by reggae yeah. and ragga. But KRS, for me, I was a huge KRS fan, still am, but when he tried the hip-hop reggae thing, it never sounded no, very No, I don't know what... It never sounded <laughs> but very But when you guys did it, it was all right. It was yeah. almost like authenticated. Yeah. And you have to remember as well, we predate them. Killer Killer Podcast. Killer Killer Official Street Culture TV. Beatbox created. Killer Keller. And we're here to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Lord Almighty, ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast. Here we go again, live and direct, central London or central as you need to be. Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> it does me. You don't want to be anywhere else. You don't want to be else at all right now for the guests that we've got inside the house. Um, big shout out to our sponsors, Hodder Warriors crew over at the Crypto Moon Boys Hideout. That's some NFT business for you. Um, big shout out to the regulars, people sharing and caring. And uh, not to mention anyone's got the television app for you download for the sport and art. It's street culture. That's what we're here to do. That's what we're here to talk about. Yes, <sighs> My brother, I... Where to begin? Where to begin with a gentleman that's... Uh, Part of our history, it's part of the landscape. Um, help put, I help build the landscape. You help build the landscape. Mm-hmm. You brought in people like myself to the landscape. Mm-hmm. You recognise what's great and what's mediocre. Mm-hmm. It's fucking Rodney Peanuts. I'd, like, I'd like to think so. Rodney Peanuts. <laughs> Respect, brother. Respect, brother. How are you doing? <laughs> How are you? I'm all right, and I'm not too bad. Yeah? Staying busy. Staying busy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing after so long to turn on Yeah, say that. I mean, honestly, as as a teenager, I never imagined this journey. Mm. Like, I didn't. I didn't think choosing to be a rapper mm-hmm. <laughs> would take me on this journey. You know, mm-hmm. it wasn't really like it was a, a, a natural career path that you would choose. Mm. But thankfully, it's been able to you know give me a pretty good life. Isn't it crazy, the idea? Like, 2023 and onwards, whenever you're watching this, mm-hmm. the whole idea... Oh, one the... second. I've got to say big up to the crew locked in. I ain't even done that. Big up all the massive locked in. Big up my man Keller. Mm. Yeah, we keep it far. You know? like, like, listen, and this is a, a pirate radio veteran, a commercial radio veteran, all across the airwaves. Let's not forget that. And I, I think that's kind of what I really want to highlight on this show. Mm-hmm. You know, I've seen a lot of podcasts, you know, jarring the... You know, the ribs <laughs> and trying to get information and yeah. uh, unsettling conversations out of you, brother. But uh-huh. I, I know you more than that. And I, I, I feel... I've known you a long time. <laughs> yeah. it's, been a, it's been a minute. Yeah. Yeah. And I think to do you the honour and, and a justice in telling the story that we rarely get opportunity to talk about. We've had, you know, big up Dolby, big up, you know, Hallett, big up all the original B-Boys. Yeah, no doubt. Kind of, but, no you doubt. know, we, we haven't had it from an MC perspective. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, okay. You were there from the jump. Absolutely. So please. Well, indulge. you know what? I couldn't even say that. I couldn't even say I was there from the jump because the, the MCs in the UK existed before I did. Like I came into the scene as a fan of some UK MCs. Give us some names. Um, Daddy Speedo, <laughs> um, Cookie Crew, um, Junior G and the Capital Boys. You know, uh, got a big up mystery. Uh, family Quest. Family Quest oh, as, family as a crew. Quest. You know? <gasps> These people existed before. And, and saying all of that, I know there's people whose names I'm forgetting. But they all predated me. They all predated London Posse. I came in as a fan of the scene. Mm. So, you know, I, I, I was there to witness what they were doing. Mm. But I was a fan of what they were doing before I ever came out as artist. In 2023, to be able to say there wasn't a, a job role, a, a career move as mm. an MC. It's quite unheard of. Everyone's jumping on mics now. And yeah, everybody, making... everybody's an MC. Everyone's on YouTube, <laughs> yeah. like, thinks they're going platinum by the end of the week. Yeah, yeah. But it, it didn't exist in our day. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have MySpace. We didn't have, mm. you know, whatever, whatever they're using now, TikTok or whatever mm. the latest the, the latest app or social media thing is. We didn't have any of that. We mm. just had love. Yeah, <laughs> you know? love for the thing you were doing. Yeah. 
I love for the culture more. Like in our day, it was more of a, a, a cultural thing. Mm. So hip hop was all of it. You didn't get into hip hop and say, yeah, I'm going to be a rapper, I'm going to be a break dancer, I'm going to be a body popper. You just came in and kind of did all of that stuff. Like I body popped a bit, I break danced a bit, I, I did a bit of graffiti, I used to do a tag, I used to, I did, I did all of that stuff. Before I was even an MC, before I started rapping, you know, it was just, that was part of the culture and we loved hip hop culture. That's what came first. Oh, God. Yeah. You can already tell this is going to be a great fucking episode. <laughs> um, like you say, it was before it was pre internet. And I think this yeah. is where the conversation can get really interesting before all of that. And I remember a very rare episode of Yo MTV Raps where you, Black Radical Mark, I said the name like three times and I've got it wrong. Black <laughs> Radical Mark II, yeah. yourself, there was a whole bunch of others as well. But these, you guys stood out mostly because of the um, lawlessness uh, and the brazenness of just being yourself. Yeah. And um, you guys were the first people that I know Fab Five, Freddie would have ever chatted to from a British standpoint, but with your own English accent, it's a stereotypical conversation yeah. drawing in now, but yeah. it's true. There was nothing else and there was no there, internet. There, uh, there was nothing else and there was no one else like us. There was no other crew in the UK that was doing what we was doing as London Posse, which was using our own voices and using the elements around us that we grew up with musically. So we started putting a lot of reggae music into the hip hop, which which had existed before, but not in the way that we were doing it. How close we, was reggae in of its time to to street culture and and rap? Reggae was the street culture. That's the street culture I grew up in. I grew up on sound system culture, reggae music in my house. I come from a Jamaican family. I don't know nothing else but reggae music. Or soul and funk, you know, rare groove, boogie music, you know. That was you, all, you lived that with was your mother, didn't you? you, you I grew up with my mum, yeah. yeah. But there was, I, I've got a few siblings, so <laughs> it was different varieties. My sister would listen to Lover's Rock. My elder brother was a hardcore reggae man. Like, and then coming down, like, you know, one of my brothers was more of a soul head. One of them was a kind of do a bit of everything. Roller skating in Battersea Park. All of these things were the energy that I grew up around. This predates hip hop. Like, them times, I have never heard of hip hop. For, for most people, you know, that culture of hip hop, the first time we really saw it, we'd seen elements and bits of it. But the first time that we really saw it as a cultural thing, was when we saw the Buffalo Girls video. And when we saw that, we saw break dancers, body poppers, graffiti artists, all in, in the same space, on the same screen. And that was the culture, you know? And and there was like, it was, um, who were the guys? Um, they had the radio, world-class wrecking crew. Not what? world-class wrecking crew. Um, Go on, oh, go on. No, you got, no, you what said World Class Record Glue. No, no. That was Dr. Dre's thing. Yeah, that's right. Class yeah, 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 yeah. It was the New York thing. Uh, but they're in the, they're in the, uh, they do the intro for the Buffalo yeah, Girls. Google that shit. Yeah, look, the look the out, look out, out for yeah. yourself. You've got the internet <laughs> now. You can find anything you like. But yeah. those guys were in it hosting a radio show as well. So we got all of those elements all brought to us at one time. You know, before that, it was, it was, we had the Sugar Hill Gang, obviously. Mm -hmm. that, that came out. Then there was a window. We had Jeffrey Daniels doing the body popping thing and the moonwalk on, on top of the pops way before Michael Jackson did mm -hmm. it. And then we got the Buffalo Girls video. And all of those elements combined taught us what hip hop was as a culture. Changed the world. Changed the world. I mean, look now, what's the, what's the biggest culture now? Nothing. There's nothing. It, it's it's hip hop. Did, did you see that uh, wave of hip hop come through across your... your, your, your um Circle of friends. Did you see suddenly like a, a, a landscape change? Um, if I'm honest, like I'm from Battersea, and um, the majority of my friends that I grew up with, a lot of them I'm still those are my friends, mm -hmm. but they've never been into hip hop. Really? Yeah, a lot of them were never into hip hop. That's like, curious. They, they, a lot of them stayed playing reggae music. Yeah. No hip hop. They would come see a hip hop show if I was going. They'd yeah, come with me, so. but they were never really hip hop fans. Still ain't really hip hop fans. Really? But you know what? That's interesting. I mean, for me, my, the hip hop culture that I it was when I discovered there was a, a there was a small group of hip hop fans in my circle, yeah. But it wasn't until we really got to Covent Garden that I found a new set of friends mm -hmm. who all have a, have had the same love for the culture that I had. So it was like Covent Garden was like this place where it was people from south, north, east, west would come to this place and unite as the people who love hip hop, mm. this is where the culture lives. 
you know. But that wasn't necessarily what was going on in Battersea no. or in Tottenham or in wherever, you know. Yeah. There was a lot of people who didn't take up hip hop. How old were you at the time when you went to Covent Garden? I was still in school, so I was probably like um, about 15. About 15. Impressionable. I mean, maybe even 40. I mean, we put out the first London Posse record. I was like 17 or 18. Are so. you getting this? He was 17 years old and the first London Posse record came out. Yeah, yeah. That was, I was young. I was a young boy. You were born into this game. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I mean, I came out of school. Um, I had just left school and I was on a YTS scheme. Um, you never heard of a YTS scheme. A YTS is a, remember youth, the commercials it's on a, the TV. It's a youth training scheme. Yeah, yeah. I remember so that. you leave school. I never had in, any intention of going to university or anything like that. I went into the world. Mm. That was my thing. I'm getting into the world. Like, So I'm doing this youth training scheme that paid um, like £29 a week, £30 a week, something like that you would get for doing it. And the opportunity came up to join Big Audio Dynamite, <laughs> um, Mick, Mick Jones and Don Let's Band. Wow. The opportunity came up to join them on tour. And they were offering us £10 a day per diems. Per diems is the thing that when you're on tour, you get given a certain amount of money to like buy some food mm. and you know to keep you ticking over yeah. for the day. They're offering £10 a day, seven days a week. You go, know? go, so go, go. That was a, a no-brainer for me. I'm going ten pound tour. That, like, then, £10 then was a... Yeah, yeah, £10 of your money then. I remember these are the times when, you know, the pound is stronger than the dollar. Like, you know, we mm. would, like, the, you know, £10 was... So that, that's £70 a week compared to the £30 a week I'm getting on this YTS scheme. Do the math. No-brainer. Do mm. the math. I'm out. Like, so... And that's, and that's really where it all started for me, on a professional level. Before that, it was always a hobby. I was always writing lyrics. I was always doing my rapping. I would rap to my friends, some of the friends who weren't necessarily into hip-hop. But, you know, they, they like to be entertained. Mm. So I was always writing rhymes and doing that stuff. I mean, I want to... I want um, <laughs> Here we go. This is I where want, the spice comes in. I go want, on. No, it's a simple thing. But I want to... Um, the, 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 the Battersea Poetry Club. I think that was the name. Um, and I'd won a poetry competition when I was like 12. So I was always playing with words. Like, so I always had an interest in rhyming schemes mm. and, you know, double entendres and mm, that kind mm, of stuff. Mm, mm, mm. So, and again, that was part of why hip hop and rapping was so attractive to me. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, I body popped and break dance, but I was terrible at that shit. Like, I loved it, but I was terrible at it. You should have picked a lane, but, just but, get on it. Right. But you see, when the hip hop shit, kind of like, when the MC shit started to get into play, I could fuck with that. You know, so. But, but the, the, I, I guess of its time, you know, we're, we're talking po uh, post Clash, Futura, um, and the whole emergence of you know Blondie and Fat Five Freddy. There was yeah, a hip hop, yeah. um, uh, punk relationship there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big they, Audio they, Dynamite, and you yeah, made. But it was more. That was very much more um, on an artistic level. So there was, like you say, the, the big Futura, Futura piece yeah. and the Clash piece. Yeah. I mean, they had that at the Sashi Gallery. I, yeah, still, I think it's going on till May. So that's, that's as an advert, if you haven't been to see that Sashi Gallery hip hop exhibition, fifty years of hip hop mm. exhibition, you're, you're, you're mugging yourself. Mm. Go and see that, and mm. you'll see stuff there that is the stuff that people like me were brought up yeah. on. Begs and belief, seeing like, it in the flesh. Actually, like it's funny because that, that that exhibition. I've told this story before in in interviews about when we first went on tour, the same tour I'm talking about, and we didn't have a name yet. We were uh, Bionic, C. Paul, and Roddy Rock. That was my mm -hmm. name. Then. And when you go to that that exhibition in Saatchi Gallery, they actually have that poster on the wall. No, they actually have it up. There's a section devoted to Don Letts, where they're showing um, they show pictures of him with Bob Marley because he mm -hmm. was like Bob Marley's tour guide in London. They show the clubs he was running, some of the photographs he's taken, and one of the things they've got up is part of the band he was in, Big Hero Dynamite. And it's the tour poster. So that tour poster is from 1986, 1985. Goosebumps when you fucking said that, bro. 85, 86, yeah. So you're in the Sarchi Gallery. You are there. Yeah, I mean, I'm part of the exhibition for sure. Yeah, there's another section as well where they've got some screens up and they're showing flashes and clips of like what was happening in early UK hip-hop. And a lot of it is in Covent Garden. That's and right. And there's there's also clips of London Posse performing on that too. So, so good. Yeah, yeah. 
So good. Well, we're getting definitely getting to that that feeling. <laughs> but um, the big audio dynamite is far removed from the street life that perhaps was immersive of its time mm-hmm. in the eighties. It was yeah. a di- very different landscape, wasn't it? Very different. Very different. Give us a give us a, an account of that. You know, give us the the imagery of what big audio dynamite is. Of what or the, the life, times? Yeah, the times. Um. Again, I was a young boy, fresh out into the world. Like Big Audio, Big Audio Dynamite as a band wasn't something I would necessarily be listening to. Mm. So that also opened up my ears to a, a, a wider perspective of actually what was out there and what could be done and how collaborations could be made. Um, actually, on that tour, they were, it wasn't just us as the warm ups. They had uh, the Chief of Chiefs of Relief. They were called the Pocket Rockets. And Schoolie D, Schoolie D came on the door. Casual. Yeah. Wow. And um, he was like, I mean, Bionic was always my elder. So he was always like my MC sensei. Mm-hmm. But Schoolie D was the one who kind of took me aside and gave me some important stage control lessons. Like, cause remember, we're young. We ain't never been on stage before. Mm. To that, like, we're, we're, these are big stages. Mm-hmm. These are like big audiences. And I wasn't overly confident either. Mm. I wasn't overly confident them times that as an MC. And we didn't have our routines down. So we'd make mistakes and like, you know? Mm. And he was the one who took me aside and said, well, you know, like, if you make a mistake, no one knows until you tell them. You know, like, and, until you, like, actively show the audience that you've made a mistake, yeah. they have no idea that you've made mm-hmm. a mistake. So do you have play your position, you know? And then, then it came that I would go on stage with him. So when he was doing his show, I would go out with him as his hype man. Oh my so like, God. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking about this. It's been a long time since I thought about that. How do you, you feel when you think about it? It's, it's fucking amazing. It's amazing. Like, you know, when you're living it, you're in the moment. But in, in hindsight, it's like, wow, did I really do that? Yeah. Like, you original gangster. Like, yeah, yeah I mean, Schooly D is the guy. Like, he, like I don't think, I think, I think, I don't think enough people in this generation actually know who he is. Yeah. And Schooly D is credited as being the original and first gangster rapper. He Amen. had a tune called Park Size Killers, which was, um, that was the name of the, 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 the gang that he was in. Yeah. And Ice T recognises him, that tune that he did, um, um, Six in the Morning Police at tune. My Door. He got the inspiration from that for Schooly D. Now, that is considered oh. the first West Coast gangster rap. This mm. predates NWA. Them times, Dr. Dre was in the World Class Wrecking Crew mm. wearing, you know, spangles and mm. spandex, mm-hmm. you know? Google that as well if yeah, you want. Yeah, you can Google that too. We'll, World we'll Class talk. Wrecking Crew. This, this predates all of that yeah. stuff. So in hindsight, it's like I, I, I had some amazing opportunities and I'm lucky that I was able to take them and, and live through them and get to this point here today. Sometimes you need a, a, a vehicle like Big Audio Dynamite, which is complete, I guess the closest common denominator of, of our generation, the generation now, it's probably Gorillas, where they have a different rap perspective yeah. and other people want to jump on it because yeah, it's different. Yeah, I mean, I've got to give them crowds a lot of credit. Like, they were so open-minded as, as individuals and as a, as a band. Mm. They were so open-minded and forward-thinking. Mm. You know, they, they took us on tour because they liked what we did and they liked the energy. Nothing more than that. Mm. Like, we went to, to Mick Jones's house and um, we were in his, basement, in his basement with Mick and Don was there as well. Maybe Leo, the bass player, was there as well, actually. I think maybe Leo was there. Mad. And um, we were just jamming. We're just jamming, rhyming, you know? And in the moment, again, it didn't feel like we were auditioning, but I guess in hindsight, we probably were doing an audition, you know? And off the back of that, it was, yeah, let's go on tour. Let's go on tour. And that that moment changed my entire life. It changed my entire yeah. life. Everything changed after that. How did, This is a really broad question, but how did it change your life in respect to... When, when I first got into beatboxing, mm-hmm. you start in one place yeah. where you really want to be it. Yeah. But then you get to an age where you are it. Yeah. And then you get to this point where you can't really go back because you really, yeah. and you can only go forward. So I guess yeah. what, I'm it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it almost becomes this, it yeah. almost becomes the spinal tap joke, doesn't uh, it? It, it, like, it, <laughs> it, is, it is very much so. I mean, like I said to you earlier, I never expected to have a career as an MC. Mm-hmm. Like, 
even after London Posse formed and then we were putting out music, it still felt quite distant that this will last forever, mm. you know? Mm. So when London Posse started winding down, I never really expected to have a solo career. That wasn't something that was on my mind. To, to me, I always assumed Bionic would have a solo career and I would go back into the real world. Man, and you have to remember as well, I'm saying all of this, it wasn't as though London Posse was consistent from the outset. Mm -hmm. So we got an initial record deal, we put out a record. Um, there was a certain conflict of interest. Okay. Like, you can't be our record company and our publisher and if I see you as your lawyer, <laughs> you know? Mm, yeah, yeah, we're yeah, young, yeah, but yeah, we're not yeah, stupid. Yeah. So, yeah. so we left out of that situation. So we're back out in the wilderness, you know? Um, then we linked up with Westwood. Westwood set up Justice Records. Mm -hmm. He had us and a group called Trouble Rap, which mm. had DJ J and MC Trouble. And we, we both put out tunes. That's where we put out the tune Money Man. Mm -hmm. which was a big tune for us. It was seismic. That was a big tune for us. And the UK really caught on to that tune, mm -hmm. really caught on to that tune. But then Westwood's label folded as well. Mm -hmm. So now we're back out in the wilderness. And when I say out in the wilderness, I mean back to the real world. I mean, I'm back in Battersea on the ends doing like whatever, mm -hmm. like, you know. Mm -hmm. But then luckily enough, um, the, the Money Mad, the CD... I'd given it to someone who took it into Island Records and they were like, we've been looking for these guys. It was an was a and r guy called Mikey Roots. I have to pick up Mikey Roots. I ain't seen him for years. Pick up Mikey. And um, we were on Mango Records, which was a subsidiary of Island. Mm -hmm. It was Suzette Newman and a guy named Jumbo and Mikey Roots. And Suzette used to be Chris Blackwell's like personal assistant. Right. And if you know Chris Blackwell, Chris Blackwell is the guy who owned Island Records yes. before they sold it off. That's a big deal. He was the one yeah. who brought out Bob Marley initially. Yeah. It's huge. He, brought out the, he was huge, like Google it. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. So we were on, on Mango and on Mango at the time, they had like Shelly Funder, they had some Afrobeat artists, they had um, uh, Overlord X and the X Posse was oh, there. Legendary. Um, <laughs> You know, a few people. I met a few people those days. Mm. I remember meeting Edge from U2 in the canteen. And like, this like... <laughs> stuff here. Yeah, real really? stuff, real really? stuff. Like, this, and again, this is all... The, 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 the strength of it is all in hindsight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because at the time, I'm a little road route from Battersea. I ain't, yeah. I ain't showing no one that kind of... You're not getting that from yeah, me, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. actually, I was aware, like, oh, that's my man from U2. Like, that's a lot, you know? But, you know, yeah. That was Unmistakable the, as well. Yeah, because he had the hat on, of course. Yeah. Like, he always had the hat on. Yeah. So, yeah, those were the moments that really changed my perspective on potentially what could unfold. But I still wasn't that confident in myself. Like I say, Bionic was always, for me, the most important MC. I still look back. Like, I've got a whole career. I think that as, as an artist, I'm, I've, I've on many occasions shown and proved. Mm -hmm. many occasions mm -hmm. but I still think that Bionic as an artist is the one whose style many of the young people now use and they don't even know who he is yeah, 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 you know yeah, that yeah, hip hop yeah, reggae you. style that he he brung to the table mm -hmm. and that certain kind of swagger that he brung to the yeah. table like they're, they're doing that now yeah, yeah, yeah. but they don't know where it comes from because it didn't exist in hip hop before he did it KRS1 BDP they were hugely influenced by reggae yeah. and ragga, but but his so thing, was cool. Remember Cool Herx from yeah, Jamaica. True. Yeah, yeah. Cool Herx. The so, part, so this whole thing, it, it, like, it all goes back to Jamaica. But, it, but, but for <laughs> me, KRS felt really aggressive. Something about it. But when you guys did it, KRS for me, I was a huge KRS fan, still am. But when he tried the hip hop reggae thing, it never sounded. No, very I don't know what. It never sounded. <laughs> but very when you guys did it, it was alright. It was yeah. almost like authenticated. Yeah. And you have to remember as well, we predate them. Yeah. We predate them. Mm. Like, we pre predate a lot of your favourite American rappers. We were, like, the first time I went to New York, um, I bought Stetson Sonic's album. Stuff, so yeah. that's, that's that's how, how far about, we're yeah. going back. Uh, it's, it's funny, someone sent me a link on Instagram two days ago. Um, I wish I could remember his name, but, brother, if you're watching, I apologise for not calling watching. your name. He'll be watching. But, um, he sent me a link a couple of days ago to the, the, the Bridges Over video. The, the, mm -hmm. the Boogie Down production, Bridges Over video. And I sent him back a message saying, because it's a message, it's a live, it's in the club. Mm -hmm. And I sent him back a message saying, I, I was there. 
Like me and Bionic was there for that. Get the f- get out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, we that, is that, that a little known fact or is that... Is that's this... a li- I guess that's a little known that's fact, but we were there for that. So you have to recognise when they're doing that, this is the first time BDP's really coming out with this hip-hop reggae thing. We're already there. Yeah. You know, so... Yeah, like that was in Union Square. It was filmed in the Union Square Club. Scott LaRock was still alive. Mm. Just Ice was there. He was on the stage with them. And um, yeah, that's part of the history. For How us. does it make you feel when you're recounting this? This this is bonkers that I you were there. I just think that a lot of people just don't understand how deep it goes and how ingrained in this thing we are and were and will be, you know? Like you can't erase or, or, or you know, rewrite our place within this thing. Absolutely. And again, for me, a lot of it is in hindsight because when you're in the moment, you're just living it, you know? But when I get to look back, I think, fucking hell, be like, mm. <laughs> like mm. you done some stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know? But yeah. here we are, still here. Reflectant. Very reflectant. Um, going back to when you parted ways with Westwood and there, like you say, there was this interim of... You could have had a lot of self-doubt at that point. For whatever reasons, being back on the ground, Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people out there that have been in those similar experiences, Mm -hmm. obviously with the privy of like social media and whatnot, but, you know, being of its time, to be on the ground after something like that, knowing that you are this person and you're looking back and looking forward and you're like, well, how how did that feel? (sighs) It, it was it was a confusing time, if I'm honest. I mean, for me as an individual, trying to work out what do I do next then? You know? What am I going to do next? What like what what path am I going to choose? Like like I said, I didn't really invigorate, envision being a solo artist. Like, I knew lots of solo. Like, I used to spar with MC Mello. That was, used to be my guy, even before London mm-hmm. Pussy. I fucking like, love Mello. Something else. Mello. Here's another anecdote I need to tell you. I Get saw, in. I saw DJ Ron the other day at the Saatchi game. Yeah, yeah, big Make up sure Ron. you reach. Big up DJ, big big up up Ron. DJ Ron. Original. D- DJ Ron is one of the, the foundation godfathers of jungle music. Without question. Without question. Okay, but did you know DJ Ron was also the, the DJ for me and MC Mello as a group way before London Pussy? And he's from, he's from East London, and we're from South. He was originally a hip-hop DJ who did incredible mixes. And we used to travel from South to go check him at his mum's house and make music. This bit, jungle don't exist in time. There's not no today, such Rodney, thing as jungle. It's too late in the evening for this, Rodney. Yeah, sure. This is huge. Yeah, ask Ron. Get Ron up here to do it. Yeah, well, well, I've they tried. Ron, you, Ron, Ron, you've been told now. Right? But well, you can, you're going to have to swap him because you know he's got his podcast as well. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know I mean? Big up that yeah, as well. Big yeah. up Ron. Big up we had a good Ron. chat at Saatchi and uh, yeah, I would never have thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the, the first DJ we had. This is like, you no. Know, DJ Pogo is my man. Uh-huh. Cutmaster Swift is from Battersea. That's my dude. But the first man I'll ever claim as who was a DJ for me and for us, me and MC Mello, was DJ Ron. At which point, and, 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 and you have to remember at that time, business. East London is the other side of the world. Oh well, yeah, but we're prepared to make that trip because and it, I can't actually remember how we initially met, but I know it was he used to make hip hop mixtapes. And we used to listen to his mixtapes and just think, these are fucking amazing. Big Audio Dynamite, that's West London, right? That's West London. Yeah. yeah that's a so you were, you were moving quite a lot, considering yeah, 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 yeah. the geographic of, you know, the mindset of, of a kid, you know. Ah, oh, man, like, pff, there were nowhere I wouldn't go. Yeah. Like, if there was something there that I wanted to see, I wanted to do, I'm going. Uh, yeah. Like, and that ain't even just London, that's anywhere. I'm going, like. You know, a man had that kind of mentality. And this wasn't me climbing out the window of my mum's house. Okay, well, I occasionally had to climb out the window of my mum's house. But generally, like, you know, it was all good. I'm like, this is the thing I'm part of and I want to be down. Mm. So, you know, you have to put in the work. At this point, obviously, we talked about Barnick, Sipo, which for me, rest in peace, that that, that holds so many. Mm. He's accountable for so much of my... Creative angst. Right, right. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's a lot of people thing. would say that. Yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways, it was Sipo that put together Lana Pussy. Yeah. And he didn't put us together as the group. I mean, he put us together as the group. He didn't put us together as London Pussy. Mm. We, but he's the one who brought us all together to say, let's make this coalition mm. and, and like, do this thing. And mm. then from, cause, because he had the initial relationship with Mick and Don. Mm. 
through his beatboxes. Right. So he had that initial relationship and he brought us into that situation. So I got big up Blade for beatboxing. There's a guy called Turbo T as well, yeah. if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. not that I remember, but I hold on to names yeah. very dearly. Yeah. These were the contemporaries of beatboxing of his yeah. time, but Sipo was most certainly, yeah. he was the bridge gapper of all Absolutely. sorts of things. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Incredible. Mm. You know, the, the, the whole idea of there was a guy that I, I, I kind of was walking in the paths of, like me and my journeys, right. but the Sipo was way ahead of the time. Yeah, 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 he was really early in the curve. Like, and he's one of the people I got to Covent Garden and met. And Sipo was younger than me. So, like, you know, like, he was in it from early. He was already there. Incredible. Mm. Um, right, there's an elephant in my room, which I need to bring up, okay? okay? okay. So... <laughs> Uh, I'm, it's 1999, uh -huh. um, a young with a snapper thinks he knows it all killer keller uh -huh. goes to Nottingham and meets Rodney for the first time. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I talk about this shit all the time. I'd like to think I was very welcoming. You were very welcoming, oh, great, but cool. it was a real moment, right? Because <laughs> I'm a fucking cocksure, you know, rural guy. I've got, you know, I'm from a working class village that just has only ever seen the Don's on TV and I don't know I, my intro was you were like I was like killer killer and he was like big up big up and I was like oh good to meet you Rodders like that I went Rodders like that. and I said lesser the Rodders no no it wasn't it was like it was like good to meet you too don't call me Rodders again <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you know when your elders are just like yeah I'll change my whole game yeah. from that moment yeah. Yeah. you know what it was <laughs> them times you know it was them times <laughs> Only Fools and Horses was really popular. Yeah, yeah it was popping. It, it was yeah. really popping. Yeah. I was I was a fan of the show myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the character Rodney, they used to call him Rodders. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like that at all. Of course not. Like, my name ain't Rodders. Don't call me that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, now I'm older, I don't give a fuck now. Like, yeah, really, like... Poetic but, as fuck. But I can tell you, at that time, anyone who called me Rodders would yeah. get that response. <laughs> don't do it again. It's true. It just, it taught me so much... And yeah, stay on your P's and Q's. Stay on your P's. Yeah. Like, don't ever be over familiar. Yeah. Not at yeah. 21 years old, bro. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then obviously we killed it at the shows. Mm -hmm. And from then on. They're, they're, I guess people don't know that we ever used to work. No. I guess people don't even know that. So no. there's, like, there's some more history. Like, so much history. I've known Keller for many moons. This mm. isn't like, I ain't just here doing this podcast because some random dude asked me to come and do this podcast. I remember when Terry came down to the live show. It was such right. a seismic moment. Well, you know, Ty, rest in peace, mm -hmm. was there as well. And, you know, this wasn't like, I hadn't even put a call in. You guys were just there. Right. You just right. rocked up. And Terry's like, my queen. She's my sister. No, yeah, yeah. yeah. Skits. Yeah, my dude. My brother. <laughs> yeah. Now, that was a... a that was nuclear, and it's funny because I was, I was, you know, as you do, you you you, you thumb your way through your recommendations on Spotify, mm -hmm. and uh, Countryman came up, and um, it was only, it was that only was a, that was definitely a moment. But you know what? If we're gonna tell that story, we have to backtrack a bit first because I was talking about the fact that I never really envisioned myself being a solo artist, and one of the big pushes for me to be a solo artist was Dolby. And I don't mean Dolby the breaker. Mm -hmm. I mean Dolby the producer. Gotcha. Who produced How's Life in London for London Post. Uh -huh. he, produced, he produced a few things for us. And when the group had split up, it was Dolby that checked me and said, I've got this tune for my album that I want you to do. And I was a bit unsure. And he's like, no, I want you to do it. You're more than capable of doing it. I want you to do this tune for me. And, and I'm going to put um, Donny on it. <laughs> Donny is one of the UK's soul R&B legends as well. Like Donny, um, Noel McCoy, rest in peace, Omar, Junior Giscom. These are the people who are really setting pace for the UK R&B and soul at the time. God, Donny was also man. signed to Island Records, but he was signed to Island Records, not Mango. Was this like Princess time? Was it that kind of, you know, Stock Aiken Walkman? Like yeah, soul yeah, yeah, those kind of times. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, 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 it was obviously a lot more pop, but it was those times. This, yeah. is, this is like the 80s. Yeah, I'm, just 80s. Like, I'm a huge Red Groove fan. Like yeah. The 80s London so, soul. Yeah, <gasps> so, you know, him giving me that, that cosign is what really gave me that early confidence. So we made a tune called Love and Hate, which he's re-released um, late last year. In the last year, he re-released it. So you can go and find that. Nice. It's on your Spotify and whatever streaming site nice. you use. That's up there. And that was the first time 
I had ever been on a tune as a solo artist, Love and Hate, which is on Dolby's album. It's called um, The Sound of One Hand Clapping is the name of the album. So you can What a great name that. of an yeah. album. Wow. Yeah, you can go and check oh, that's that. That's crazy. And you were saying, um, not that I'm quoting, maybe I'm paraphrasing, that you didn't think you were going to be the solo artist. No. Was that a confidence thing or was that just more of a... In the, uh, you, the, the USP on you compared to like what Bionic Bar- had created? No, I think... I mean, there's levels of confidence always, always in everything and mm-hmm. still. For sure. Like, you know, there's levels of moments of anxiety and, 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 and not being sure of yourself. That mm. exists all the way through your life. 100%. But why I say I thought Bionic was going to be the solo artist is because I was such a fan of his. I was such a fan of his. Mm. Like I thought he had that spark that would be needed. I didn't assume that I... It was funny to me because afterwards, people always came to me and said, no, I, was, I thought you were the one. Like, but in my head, Bionic was always the one. Mm-hmm. Like, and I still think that. I think Bionic... There, there was a stage where I feel like, you know, I found my own lane and voice and then no one could fuck with me. Mm-hmm. Like, when I'm doing me, no one can't do me better than me, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And Bionix does his thing, and no one can't do him better than him. Mm-hmm. So there was a point when I'm fully grounded in, like, let me fucking pee, you can't tell me nothing. Yeah, but, yeah, you got know, you. It, it takes a moment to get there, yeah. you know? And and again, like I say, a big part of me getting there was that cosign from Dolby. So I always got to show you. Big up Dolby. Dolby. I, could, I, could, I could not have this conversation without bringing up his name. Dedicated as a song... For me, was dedication. Dedication. Mm-hmm. That's all you need. Yeah, big old yeah. 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 Um, dedication. Uh, I think nineteen ninety seven, ninety eight, ninety eight, maybe these were, these tunes were surfacing, yeah. and uh, for me and three sixty physicals of its time, with my collective and crew, we used to meet up at Deal Real and. These of course, were those were the spots. <laughs> Uptown Records and Dark and Cold. And Dark that. and Cold. Yeah, these are the spots. But uh, Nicky Black Market yeah. Black Market Records where Jungle started popping off. Wild and, like, Pitch. And wild Pitch, bongos. of course. Yeah, these, these, these were the spots. These were like the community spots that were all, all day Saturday is spent in the West End bouncing from place to place yeah. where you know your tribe is going to be. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. These were the soundtracks of that time and yeah. it was with social gatherings. Yeah. And I say this all the time, you know, you, you meet Rodney, you don't realise that this is Rodney P or Roots Maneuver or yeah, Shorty Roots Blitz, was, yeah, these yeah, yeah. dons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you just don't expect to be bumping into these people, but they, you were all there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was, that was just local for us. Yeah. yeah, that was local. That's that's what we did. And plus, it's a generational thing. Like I, lo- I think a lot of the young people now don't understand or recognise or even have any concept of the importance of the record shop because they're just not there anymore. Mm. The record shop was the place. Yeah. Like, you, 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 if you're into music, where else are you going to be? But in the record shop, you know? And I was one of the guys. I've got to say big up to Basil. Like, a lot of men don't know Basil, but a lot of men do. Basil was the guy with the van who would bring in the import records and drop them off at the record shops. And there was a select few people (laughs) who could get in the van. So if you could get in the van... Get in the van. Actually get in the van, you would have access to shit that ain't even in the shop yet. It ain't even left the van yet. I have never heard of that. Yeah, big up Basil. Like, certain man be able to tell you that. The man them in the record shops would be able to tell you about Basil. Basil was like... I ain't seen Basil for years, but he was so important. So important because he's one of the few people, like I say, who actually had the imports and it, and was taking them from shop to shop. So, got a big up Basil. Big up Basil. Mm. How did you meet Skits? How did I meet Skits? I don't really know, you know. There's anomalies. Two headed monster. <laughs> That's I what it really was. Know. I mean, I guess, I guess, I probably heard the Roots Maneuver tune that he did. Huge. Yeah, wicked tune. Oh. Uh, where my mind is at. Uh, just uh, yeah. mind-blowing. The, the yeah. piano and Amazing the... tune. Amazing Ooh. tune. Big and skits. And then off the back of that, I ain't really sure. I think he might have phoned me. Or I might have phoned him. Or someone might have... Been, I'm, not, I'm really not sure. Really not sure. But we decided to do a tune together. And the first thing we ever made was dedication. I remember MK being behind the decks in Deal Rule and th- th- these tunes were being spun... Bro, like, and for for the likes of us that you know, you really rarely only 
you mostly only get Americanized kind yeah. of versions of yeah. anything on TV, but just felt like we were so close to the action, man. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think dedication was an important tune for the scene, but also for for me and skits and for me as an MC yeah. and being able to get that message out. It was a, it was a heartfelt record. Mm. You know, that, that they never knew about us English kids. That was it. We that lived, was that you know what I mean? call to arms right there. Yeah, that was like, it, it, it was, I, I was being honest. Yeah. And it was, I was like, I felt that. Like, yeah. they, don't, they don't show us no fucking respect. Call like, to fucking arms, man. Yeah, like, fuck it. Let's like, let's talk the thing, yeah. like, you know? And at the time, MCD was my favorite MC in the oh, world. You can't, t- you couldn't it. tell MCD me no. So much. And, and the thing with MCD that a lot, a lot of people don't recognize, you might hear his records, but if you never saw him live, Different you beast. really don't know what I'm talking about. I remember seeing him at Mudlam's sick. He was a monster. Beast. He was a monster. Like he was so good, you know. So the people who were there know exactly what I thought I was mm. talking about when I said that line. Mm. I don't feel no MC mm. like I feel MCD. And in that window of time, that was absolutely a fact. Like you know, crazy. So generally, that record was about yeah. Can we stand up? And it was important that I didn't say um, it's dedicated to London. Because it wasn't a London tune. Yeah. Big up all the man the amount of town will make moves. That's an important line mm. because this isn't a London scene. It's a UK scene. You know, it was, you know, Scott, I was in, I used to go to, to Ireland a lot. Check my man DJ Mech stay in his mum's house. Big up Mech. Yeah, up my yeah, Mech. Is you know a, what I mean? A, that's another, that's a he's a monster. Many, like, many drinks with him. Yeah, man, he's got me <laughs> drunk many a time. But he'd get pissed up and get on the turntables and do amazing yeah, shit. Yeah. Like he, he wasn't t- drunk. Yeah, today, yeah. he's one of the greatest DJs today. I'm with you. You know, like, so, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a London thing. It was always been a UK thing. It's about this 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 fair island, the islands close to us. Remember them times mm. as artists, especially as UK artists, we're selling a lot of records in France and Germany and Amsterdam and all of these foreign territories mm. where our music is imports as well. It you wasn't know? regionalized. I yeah, there's an like, argument that it's that... just it's just do you like it or you don't? That's them times yeah. Brickcore yes. was the thing. Very much so. Hard noise and yeah. Gunshot Shot, and yeah. Overlord X. Pick up all of them as well. Pick yeah. up all of those artists who had a specific kind of like bomb squad kind of production sound, yeah, real like hard shit. breaks, I real hard jumps. Too. Yeah, I but that shit had a, a, a huge mm. audience internationally yeah. that people this here aren't aware of. They're yeah. Like this new generation think they've reinvented the world. And, and the only time that the UK music scene or the UK hip hop scene has ever seen success is now. But that's a mistake. Because I remember watching Derek B and the Cookie Crew and we pop a girl rappers on Top of the Pops. Like, and again, these kids don't know what Top of the Pops is, but we only had three channels. We had BBC One, BBC Two it's and true. ITV. It's I true. remember when Channel 4 was brand new and when Channel 5 was brand new. Yeah. And Top of the Pops used to come on on a Thursday night and was much see television, must watch television. Mm. And then on Friday morning, whatever was on the Top of the Pops was what was in the playground. Yeah, yeah. You know, so... The next day. The next day. Like, like I was saying, when Jeffrey Daniels was on Top of the Pops and he was body popping and doing the moonwalk and all of that stuff, the next day in school, that's what we were doing. God. Trying to learn how to do the wave and like all of that shit, you the, know? Yeah, yeah. These were moments and... Yeah, I mean, UK hip-hop has had many successes over the years that, that seem to be... Just blowing the dust, but mm. they, they were real. They I, were, and I, I know they were because I was there. We were there. Yeah. I remember. And you know, this is where it gets interesting because, like you say, you never knew about us English kids. You know, the likes of Serena, profile agency, big up Serena. Big up Serena. I still see Serena out in the field every day. Like, come festival on, man. season, I always see yeah, Serena. Yeah, she's always there. Big up yeah. Serena. Big up Spider J. Big, yeah. big up Andy Doug and big up Becky. Andy Doug. Do you remember? Yeah. Hold oh tight. These are all yeah, agents, by the way. We are, we are being extremely self absorbed <laughs> here. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, these were people that, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be, well, we probably would have had a different variation of it. Yeah. But these guys had their finger on the pulses as Absolutely. far as Absolutely. where to take this UK yeah. live. Yeah. Yeah. Show. Serena helped me eat. That's a fact. Yeah, fact. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, it just is a fact. Mm. So mm. yeah. There was there was there was an another industry that that again it just gets overlooked now, but mm. it existed. It was mm. real. And it was achieving. Mm. You know, mm. it was achieving. But I think like I think in a lot of ways we dropped the ball. And a lot of the old school man them don't like to hear this shit. Like I have conversation with lots of youngers and I end up in arguments and I have lots of conversations with elders and end up in arguments because I think us as elders dropped the ball and weren't keeping an eye on what was coming next and weren't building bridges for what was coming next and helping 
the pathway be created for these new artists to come through because we were all too busy trying to be artists ourselves. So when this new stuff started coming, instead of embracing it and saying, well, what's going on over there? We were busy saying, ah, that's shit. I think some of that, I know what you mean. And I think some of that probably, it comes from a place of hand to mouth still. I mm. think the privilege that, we had, and I say the Royal Wees is, you know, this is very much about you guys, mm. but for us to, to have the realist one time only window of opportunity yeah. to actually be living off a thing that in, in many respects, you do, this is water by the way. Yes, yes, exactly. So yeah. don't you get any funny ideas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Genuinely though, it just it felt, it felt like a real, like, Stabilizes off. We're, we're riding. Yeah. Um, so I, I can appreciate that. Probably from both sides of the the, the, the argument, it, it, it's it's hindsight. It's all in hindsight. Because you it's can't. All in you can't. The money that was there yeah. was sparse, and yeah. you can't vision. Be visionary and put keep putting food on your table. You yeah. worry about that shit. Yeah. Yeah, 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 very much so. And again, we didn't have the technology to really do the stuff that the kids are doing now. We didn't. It just didn't exist. No. We we couldn't have the kind of outlets that they have now because mm. they just weren't there, you know? So mm. there is definitely that element that I think, you know, I think if you grow up now, you think the internet's been there forever. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It really hasn't. Like, it's, it's in the big scheme of things, the internet is mm. new, mm. Like, you know? Mm. But if you were born in, you know, the 80s, mm. that's been your whole life. You ain't never known anything else. Mm. You know, by the time you reach your teenage years, that's, that's just life. The kids now ain't going to never know a time without mobile phones mm. or using public telephone boxes or using an A to Z to find your way around <laughs> London, you know? It was yellow, yeah. right? <laughs> and it, it was really, really cumbersome long. Yeah, they're like, they're, they'll yeah. never know that, yeah. but, it, it, but it's real. But then looking in the other direction, where I say I argue with youngers as well is because Something like grime, like a part of it. I've had this conversation recently. So there's a, there's there's a, um, a a talk that's coming out on YouTube um, as part of the hip hop fifty thing that you've done. That we've done already. Fantastic. I do, I do it with um, it's me and Cookie from the Cookie Crew, DJ Semtex and Governor B. Governor B. Well, that's gonna be a watch, yes. So it's, it's, it's nice. definitely look out for that. But um, within that. One of the things I say is that for me, grime, although I have to put my hands up, when the grime thing first came out, I was like, this shit's terrible. That man, like, that's terrible. Mm. Although now I think some of the best MCs in the UK come from that scene. I think Getz is one of the best MCs in the country. Hard. Hands down, hard, hard. But at the and time... I'll give Manga a shout as well because for his Manga, position yeah. in the game. Manga, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. See, there are certain MCs who always had, like, there was a lot of it was just repetitious and mm. this... It, it felt like you're just doing hooks and yeah, making yeah. noises. Patterning for the clubs kind right. of Right, yeah. it was all patterning. It seemed like, you know, the UK garage scene, the UK garage MCs were party hosts mm. and extremely good at it in ways that a lot of rappers couldn't do. Because mm -hmm. rappers just wanted to come and rap and rap and rap and rap. Bar, but actually, bar, you have to breathe and give the, the audience time to get involved, mm -hmm. give them some call and response. And like, you know, they were really good at that. But for me, when Grime came, when I got my head around it, I f and, and as I sit here now, I feel like grime was probably the purest form of UK hip hop at the mm. time. And I, and I say that because, because I know that a lot of you are disagreeing me, with me and shaking. Comment below, right of course, now. you know. Right? Crazy, That's fine, man. you can have an opinion, but this is mine. Like, what grime did was use all the elements that were around it. Mm. And what the artists did, because oftentimes we put everything in a box. There's hip hop, there's road rap, there's UK Garage, there's Grime, there's all of these things, and they all have their separate umbrellas. But actually, they all come from under the same umbrella. They all got a, a root in reggae music that became hip-hop. Mm -hmm. And all of it comes out of that. Mm -hmm. Now, when we started doing our hip-hop thing, we used all the elements that were around us. Mm -hmm. We used, So we started using more reggae music, and we started using more rare groove samples, rather than this James Brown samples. We yeah. were using, like, you know, other shit. Which, you know? we, which was even more relatable. That to us and mm. to the UK audience, that's what we were doing it mm. for. Now, Grime did exactly the same thing, but this is like 30 years later. Yeah. So now they're using reggae. A lot of them are, are, use, are mm. pretty much reggae mm. artists, mm. MCs. They use Garage. They use 
uh, hip hop, and they use all of these things mm. and create a new sound. The realest sound of Britain. of London, of yeah. the UK. Not even again, not just London, because this is the sound that popped off first locally, mm. then nationally, then internationally. You know, mm. but for me, under if you take away all the umbrellas and just put it under one umbrella, that shit is the purest form of UK hip hop that we've had. Thousand percent. Yeah. So you say that, but you know how many people would disagree with you? Um, Including the people who make grime, who would say, I don't make hip hop. I make grime. They don't, they don't see the connection between grime and hip hop because th they've never known it. I think maybe because some of it, and big up, Rich No Limits, um, you know, sub low as a genre. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, well, that was the precursor. Big up, man, Johnny Cash. That's Johnny Cash. Yeah, yeah, yeah Rich. Johnny, yeah, I, yeah. You know, I mean, I go by the graffiti name, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Johnny <laughs> Cash. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, they'll disagree that, Grime will disagree that that was the precursor. It fucking was. It, and it was. It come was. on, man, it was. It was. And, and likewise, dubstep. Yeah. Uh, dubstep it, was an offshoot. It was an offshoot, yeah. wasn't it? Slowed down, more clubby kind of smoke weed and slow down kind of version. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're into that sort of thing, you understand. We <laughs> don't know on this book. Um, uh, Urban Myth, is, is MC Foxy your cousin? <laughs> Foxy is more like my little brother than my cousin. Okay. Yeah. So my uncle had a long term relationship with his mum. So he was spent days and weeks in my house. God, I so love that. we grew up like he was like my little brother, Foxy. <sighs> now we're speaking. <laughs> Remember, you still owe me a skateboard from where you mash up my things. Don't forget that. I want my skateboard back. I can get it to my youth them now. <laughs> Exclusive. Exclusive. Yeah. But yeah, Foxy's my family, man. Big up, Foxy. Foxy's Drum and bass, man. And, and, and we're talking about now. We're talking about like when I'm like eight mm. and he's like five wow like, you know we're talking wow. we're kids these times one of the and, nice and, dudes as well Foxy and with man. that relationship has remained up to now yeah absolutely that's that's my little bro see and it just it... i mean he's bigger than me now but that's my little bro <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've had some great tall stories i've got like man Foxy's he's a, an amazing don't, don't, guy man. Yeah, yeah. It, there's a lot <laughs> yeah yeah we keep with that yeah hey, after after camera um uh but you know then came the internet era which garnered a whole different side to Rodney P, your solo career, collaborations with the likes of Dub Pistols and, yeah. and this more, like you're saying, more hosting, uh, just going, I guess going back to your, the original, how you even got into music. Yeah, I mean, I've always, I've always done a lot of collaborations, a lot of remixes, done a lot of various different sounds because... I like music first and foremost. So, mm. if you're gonna hear a, if you're gonna hear a Rodney P album, it's gonna be a hip hop reggae album. Mm -hmm. That's the, what I do. I do hip hop reggae music. Yeah, you know, some of them may be more hip hop than reggae. Some of them may be more reggae than hip hop. But that's always gonna be the focus. But outside of that, I just like music. So, like you know, I've done tunes with um, like Angie Stone, or I've been on a couple of Bjork remixes. I've done like. You know, I've done tunes with artists in other countries. I've got tunes that are out in New Zealand that you've probably never heard, wow. tunes in Australia. I've recorded with groups in India. I've done various different things. And linking with the Dub Pistols, who are a live band mm. with with a very eclectic sound, for me, that was f a lot of ways, there's freedom. Freedom. You know, freedom. And to be able to perform with a live band is a completely different experience than performing with a DJ. Mm. Like, completely different. And, it, and it's so much fun. It's fun. You know? I'm sure, as, as you know, oh, but it's, it's so best. much fun. But so... And, and again, we still do that stuff. Mm. I still do that. It's not as if I've stopped doing that. Mm. But, um, yeah, I've had, uh, you know, again, it's all hindsight, but I give thanks for the opportunities that I've had and the people that I've met along the way who've had enough faith in my ability to do the job. I love it. The rhythm killer inside. Um, yeah, man, oh, there can only be one. There can only be one. Mm. Uh, all right, so more of a kind of quick fire question that I think really, uh, I'm going to just throw it out there. Tell us something personal about Rodney P that no one would ever fucking know you. Like, like a hobby or, you know, something that, something that he's like, what the, what, are you kidding me? You would used to do that. You like that. You, tell us, give us something, something well, I don't, random. I don't, there's, there's, there's so many things in real life about me that people don't know. Not everything's in records. You know? Tell me, um, tell me. 
like and what we, give me give me something that is so like unpredictably okay what? i'll tell you what like right. i'll tell you what this is this is my personal business but i'm going to share it with you over the years i've driven many pretty cars many from uh-huh. teenage years uh-huh. right i've been driven many p- nice cars flashy cars that was all part of the and that was part of it yeah. and nowadays you never see me in a car i don't drive i'm not i'm not legally allowed to drive okay and the reason for that is because I have epilepsy, late onset epilepsy, and a little spot in my brain. No way. So I'm actually officially disabled because mm. of it. Like it's quite, it's, 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 it can be quite severe when it's, wow. you know. So, yeah, I, I mean, it's something that I don't particularly let affect my life, mm. but it does affect a lot of what I can and can't do. Wow, that's so incredible. there you go. There's something you, you probably ain't know. Like, Didn't yeah. see that one coming, yeah. right? I've got epilepsy, bruv, so that affects a lot. And if, if you ever wonder why you never see me turn up driving a flash car, mm. it ain't because I'm broke. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> that, of course that ain't not. The reason. So there's a rock star inside the building. <laughs> How many kids you got? I've got three kids. Oh, beautiful. Son and two daughters. Yeah. Son and two daughters, eh? And I'm married. And I'm married. Big so, up, so Rodney Pete the doggies, you know, them days they'll, they'll put that hat down. I ain't a doggies. No hold man. tight, you know, we know you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a married man now, yeah. Are you a happy man? I'm a happy man, yeah. Mm. I've been through trials and tribulations. The last few years have been rough, mm. rough. I, I can't lie. And, it, and that includes, like, like f- finally getting my diagnosis because for a, a good few years it was, I don't know what the fuck's happening. There's something going on with me, but I'm not sure what it is. Mentally, like something with the... With yeah. The, wow, okay. Like, you know, and then I start having these seizures and they started quite small and then they got really big and mm. then like, this is some weird shit. And then, you know, no one's giving you an actual answer to what's going on. So getting getting through all of that shit. Um, you know, I've, I've had a few bereavements over the last few years as well of people that were most important to me in my life. Sorry so to hear that, bro. These, these things... They kind of affect you personally, but also affect your outlook, you know? So, yeah, there's been a lot going on. The last couple of years have been rough. When Dave... But they've also been extremely creative. Of course. You know, like, it, it, it gives you something to say and something to talk about and something to write about. And for me, I'm an I'm a, I'm a elder, but there's never going to be a time in my life mm-hmm. when I don't write what I feel, you know? That's... that's that's always been an outlet for me. I write what I feel. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's given me it's given me a lot of new material. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? So you have to see the blessing in everything. When Dave um, Della, rest in peace, passed away, I, yeah, I definitely I just felt that you know, Ty and his contribution. It was almost like a, the DNA to to that side of hip hop yeah. in the states, and Ty was so. So instrumental to it, all of our careers. Yeah. Um, you were, I'll give, this was, you, Kingdom was one of the last, and this will be the last thing we talk about, by the way, because you can't have everything. <laughs> man's got a history to continue writing here. But I um, just wanted to send a, a message to Ty, man. And, and, and the fact that you were one of the last people, you guys were the last mm. official collaborative project that. You know what? That, that kind of hurts my heart, that shit. Just to talk about it because. People never got to see the vision that collectively we had. That's me, Tony and Ty, Black mm-hmm. Twang mm-hmm. and Ty. And I think a lot of people misconstrued what we were trying to do. We took the title Kingdom. Well, personally, big and boasting, no one can't tell Come me on. I ain't a king. Come like, on. But this thing here, I'm one of the kings, you can't tell me nothing. That's big and blood clot boasting, you can't tell me nothing. But the, the reality is, what we intended to do, like we've put together this EP. This is the Kingdom EP. Next thing we were going to do, supposedly, but unfortunately died past, was that we wanted to make an album. And the album was supposed to consist of the Kingdom, which ain't this me, Tony and Ty. This is our opportunity to bring in all of these other artists. Mm. And I know some of them artists carry feelings that they didn't get brought in the first time around, but they didn't get a chance to see us fulfill the vision. I see. You know, and and it was about like raising up us. There's a lot of artists who were intended to be part of that project who we never got to have the conversation with because Ty passed. Mm. And there's no way 
that project can now continue, what we're going to do, we're going to call it Kingdom and get another new MC in who's going to fill Thai space. That's an unfillable space. Mm -hmm. So that that kind of, that was the end of that project. But um, I have set up another thing called Bridge Builders, mm -hmm. which is, is more of a, a collective group, which isn't, isn't, isn't just about music. It's a... Um, Basically, I opened up my phone book. Basically, I opened up my phone book and I said, well, I know a lot of pe different people who do a lot of different things who, if they met, could probably get some value out of that. Mm -hmm. So I set up a group called The Bridge Builders, which is, consists of rappers, singers, lawyers, social media specialists, graffiti artists, um, you know, computer people. Like, so what is this on a WhatsApp, WhatsApp that's group? A, that's a WhatsApp group. Your fingers yeah. cut out there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. But um, and, but what I've actually done, I opened it up. I, I opened it with like two hundred people in it. Fantastic. And and most of them stayed, which was surprising because I I made sure I, I that stayed. I feel Come no on, no 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 issue if you want to leave. There's no bad feelings going to mm. be held if you want to leave. But then I also took the broom out and swept out a lot of people because it's important that if you're in that group, mm. you're actively in that yeah, group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This isn't, I, I sit on the sidelines mm. and watch and this ain't no space for yeah, no yeah, voyeurism. Yeah, yeah. You have to be down with collaborating and working and, and using whatever you can bring to the table. It's a, it's a case where, I mean, we got a lot of youth workers. If you've got a youth pro project and you need some break dancers, go in the group, you'll find them. Like I've got a friend of mine who works in the youth club. The youth club I used to go to as a kid that my daughters now go to. And he came to me just last week and said, you know what? I need someone to do a graffiti project with the group of the group of kids that they mm -hmm. have in the youth club. I was like, I've got my dude, he's in the group. Like, I gave him a holler, wow. that shit can get sorted out. You know, wow. like, that's what the group is for. It's that's about incredible. collaboration and building. It's not just about stroking my ego and it's not just about celebrating what we did in 1994. It's about mm. celebrating what we're going to be doing in 2025, yeah, 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 yeah. 2030. What are we going to be doing then? As elders and as bigger men, instead of us bitching and moaning about the success of these young people, let's have a hand in trying to shape where it goes. You say you don't like UK drill because it's just murder music. Well, what are you presenting to counteract it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's what it's about. And there's enough know? pieces to the pie for everybody. There's enough pieces to the pie and there's enough artists, there's enough young artists in this country who don't want to talk about killing people, yeah, yeah, yeah. don't want to talk about their life on road, don't want to talk about how many times they've been prisoned. They don't want to talk about yeah. that. Even if they've done all of those things, they mm. want to talk something else. There's a lot of kids out here who are on really positive paths. But One and X again, is not yeah. playing that shit. Yeah. One Extra wants to play crime music. Mm -hmm. Capital Extra wants to play crime music. They want That's what they want. Mm. Actively, they'll promote that shit. Mm. I'm saying, look, can we, can we as elders set up some pathways that these youths who want to do something else can get the opportunity to do something else? God, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's working. And, it's, and at the moment, it's working really well. There's a lot of collaborations being put together. I'm kind of executing a, a, an album at the moment that's trying to get different kind of producers with different kind of MCs, like, you know, just to push the boundaries a bit. You know, I, I can honestly say I get bored of having the same conversations over and over again. Mm. I'm in a position where I want to hear some new shit. I want someone to, to make me say, rah. That's fucking fire. I ain't never heard no shit like mm. that before. That's where I am. Mm. You know, for real talk. Well, I hope this conversation's been good for you. Like, yeah, man, I enjoy it, man. Of course. It's all, man. Of course. Of course. It's been it's fucking been great good, having good you on, you, Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. Good to see you. My brother Rodney Pierce side the place, big oh, day up. Oh, Without question, well, there you go. Here's the history lesson, an alternative uh, reflection on the man himself. Mm. Uh, Killer Cat, a podcast out like him was out of fashion, you know what it do. Future's bright. Future's bright, yes. Sharing is caring, tell a friend to tell a friend. Remember, crime don't pay, but neither do they. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't talk to an eye, wouldn't you? Stay lucky, people. Cheers, Rodney. <laughs> Peace. Peace. Hey.